Greetings to all of you. Uh, this talk is going to be a replacement for my cancelled doctoral seminar last Thursday at the University of Seged in the doctoral program of uh, English and American uh, cultures and literatures. Uh, the topic of my talk is the lure of the occult, esoteric magical themes in some Anglo-American fiction. Uh, this uh, talk I'm going to divide into three parts and there will be three separate uh, video sections to facilitate you to, uh, to use the material in a more flexible way. So the lure of the occult in literature concerns uh, a lot of popular topics in today's uh, popular and more serious uh, literature. You can find various novels which touch upon this and the question is what is the source, what is the inspiration for these topics. I've prepared uh, 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 a PowerPoint to show you the most important facts and names and dates uh, equipped with some interesting visual material and you can see that the origin of this talk was the Orsag Laszlo Award uh, plenary lecture uh, in uh, 2015 when I had this award and I uh, had a distinguished lecture at the uh, Hungarian Society for the Study of English in Debrecen. So I'm going to use this PowerPoint and explain to you what are the important points of this whole topic. On the first uh, slide you can see a much wider horizon of references because uh, the esoteric the theme of the occult as a literary topic is not a recent phenomenon, actually it goes back as far as we can remember in the history of literature of humanity. Uh, we can go back to the supposedly very first, chronologically very first epic poem, the Gilgamesh, which is uh, a Sumerian literature, originally probably written about 2100 BC, and the text we have is an Akkadian version from the 5th century BC, so already in that we have various references to magical practices, uh, wonder making by human characters or interactions between humans and deities. If we move to the Egyptians uh, around 1500 BC we have various uh, papyri and even wall paintings with references to various uh, magical, astrological and alchemical practices. Uh, moving on to the Greeks, uh, the very first major uh, literary work in ancient Greek was the epic poems of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad is already full of interactions between gods and humans. The gods are very anthropomorphic but at the same time they are making wonders with and on the humans. Uh, however, the most magical scenes can be found in the Odyssey. Uh, just mentioning one episode, it is the uh, witch Circe, uh, the magician who turns uh, the people of uh, Odysseus into uh, pigs, if you remember that scene. Then we are moving to the Latin literature, the literature of the Romans, and again we have many works which could be mentioned, but most famous is the kind of prose novel by uh, Apuleius, the Golden Ass, which again has various scenes of magic, uh, sorcery, conjuration and the like. Uh, more or less the same time, we are in the 1st to the 3rd centuries AD already. Uh, in Greek literature, which is called the Hellenistic Greek period, we have a lot of romances. Romances, romantic stories, love stories, adventure stories, which again are full of magical scenes. Uh, again, more or less the same time, we have uh, Jewish mysticism, early Jewish mysticism, which is called the Merkaba mysticism, and in that uh, body of literature we have episodes when the rabbi falls into a trance and is lifted, maybe even in a chariot like Elijah, to the heavenly palaces and visits the heavenly palaces. Uh, again, we can see some literary references in these uh, mythological stories. In the medieval romances, 
same old story full of magic and conjuration and coming up to the Renaissance we more or less find the same alchemy, astrology and other occult motifs appear in literature all over Europe. Now kind of focusing on English literature we have uh, the Arthurian legends which again in, uh, abound uh, in such motifs then comes Chaucer, uh, the first major uh, English epic writer and in the Canterbury Tales there are a lot of references to alchemy and magic. Uh, one of the books or one of the tales of the Canterbury Tales is uh, specifically focuses on alchemy. In the Renaissance we have Edmund Spencer who fills with such motives the Fairy Queen, the very famous long epic poem. Uh, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus is the archetypal black magician who makes a pact with the devil for certain esoteric and occult powers and possibilities. Uh, Shakespeare created the famous character the white magician Prospero in The Tempest. However, many of his other plays are also full of uh, ghosts and spirits and uh, various occult motives. And also Ben Jonson who was a contemporary of Shakespeare and touched up on this topic. Uh, one of his famous comedies is The Alchemist uh, in which the main character Subtle is actually a fraud, a cheater and uh, Johnson makes fun of this character. On the other hand in the course of the play we have a lot of serious references to uh, various uh, so-called secret sciences or magical sciences and that shows that uh, Ben Johnson as a kind of uh, very learned poet was pretty much well aware of the different philosophies and different uh, theories in connection with this topic. Uh, the next uh, section of my talk uh, will offer you a few definitions. How do we define magic and the occult sciences? First of all we have to refer to the dualistic, anthropomorphic and organic pre-modern worldview or world picture. Uh, what was it like? It goes back to Plato. Uh, Plato's idea, as we know, was that uh, the world is dualistic. There is a world of ideas which are actually inaccessible to us or almost inaccessible. And there is a world of shadows, the material world in which we live and in a way we are isolated in that uh, world. However, Plato says that there are certain altered states of consciousness which enable us at least to have some glimpse of this uh, invisible, inaccessible, ideal world. And he talks about four madnesses and he says that in these four madnesses we have a certain access to these uh, otherwise inaccessible areas. These four madnesses are the following. Religious trance, uh, prophetic trance, poetry and love. Especially these two are very interesting from the viewpoint of literature because of course in certain literary work works the uh, inspiration, the powerful inspiration which occupies the mind of the poet actually brings the poet into some sort of altered state of consciousness and in that he can express uh, some sort of uh, intuitive knowledge which is not accessible with rational discursive logic. Uh, there is a close connection between the poet and the lover. We know from our everyday experience that love can inspire people to write poetry, uh, such poetry which probably they would not write if they were not in love, if they were more rational or more sane and vice versa. Because the poet, the poetic inspiration as Plato says is nothing else but the love of beauty. So somehow this interaction is quite clear in this respect. Now that's the general framework that there are two worlds the uh, transcendental world and the material world and humans are looking for certain uh, connections try to bridge the otherwise separated two worlds. Uh, after that I would like to explain three concepts or three states of mind in a way which uh, are closely connected to this uh, ambition of bridging the transcendental and the material. Mysticism, occult and magic. You should imagine these three as uh, three circles inside 
each other. The largest circle is mysticism, so the smaller circle is the occult, and the smallest circle is magic. Basically, mysticism is a kind of passive happening on uh, the human mind. It's like a, 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 a sudden enlightenment, a sudden illumination, which switches from rational to intuitive thinking and knowledge. Uh, the Greeks had a very good word for that, and this word is still popular and used by even by some modern writers like James Joyce. The term is epiphany. Epiphany in Greek means the manifestation of the divine. Of course, if the divine manifests itself in front of a human being, that completely changes the perception, the understanding, the way of thinking of that human, uh, and brings into a kind of altered state of consciousness. And it, it's not a gradual process, it happens all of a sudden. It's like a lightning or an enlightenment. Uh, the occult derives from these mystical experiences when the uh, recipients of mystical experiences try to form these experiences into some sort of teaching, in some, of, in some sort of uh, graspable summary but certainly this is not for everybody, this is a secret lore, this is exactly the meaning of occult, it's a secret knowledge. And uh, somehow the uh, acquiring and the use of this knowledge helps the uh, epiphanic illumination catalyzed. So while mysticism talks about the passively experienced uh, process, uh, the occult tries to activate this uh, knowledge which leads to the enlightenment, to the epiphanic revelation. Revelation is another good word for that. Uh, finally, magic is even more active if you are in possession of the secret lore, the occult lore. You can catalyze your will, your human will, to try to manipulate nature or even the transcendental world by the power of this occult knowledge. So magic includes procedures, rituals, ceremonies, uh, certain practices and the purpose of this practice is either to do supernaturally alterations in nature or contact the supernatural beings themselves calling up angels, demons, devils uh, and somehow getting into interaction with them. If your purposes are purely uh, pious and you want to get closer to God and the Creator, we talk about white magic, and if it's uh, more sinister or perverted, like Dr. Faustus, who, as you remember, makes a pact with the devil, we talk about black magic. These were important definitions, but further on, we can uh, define how esotericism and religion relate to each other because this is also a very important aspect. Uh, the understanding of the word esoteric can be explained by the help of Jocelyn Godwin, who is an internationally famous scholar who has written a lot on different aspects of uh, esotericism and the occult. And in his book, The Golden Thread, published in 2007, he writes the following. The, world, the word esoteric refers to the inner aspect of a religion or philosophy of which the uh, outer aspect is exoteric. So esoteric is the inner tradition, exoteric is the kind of publicly open tradition. Thus Christianity once had its esoteric side in theosophy, the science and the knowledge of God, Judaism in Kabbalah, Islam in Sufism. Hinduism in various yogas, paganism in its mysteries. Just think of the mysteries of Eleusis, of the Greeks, which are very famous. These esotericisms were not for the majority of the faithful, but for those with sufficient interest, motivation and capacity to benefit from them. Entry was through initiation. Uh, okay, uh, the Part of the problem is that in every mythology, in every ancient memory of mankind, whatever cultural groups or cultural territory or type of religion or whatever we think of, 
is that there was a golden age when humans were created by the gods and had a direct contact with the gods. It was a kind of happy symbiosis between the, 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 the divinity and the humans. And for some mistake, sin, miscalculation, whatever, this state was uh, destroyed and humans became fallen and separated from the divine. Now, of course, if you realize this uh, fallen state of yourself, obviously your ambition is to restore, to reestablish this connection and to reestablish the bygone happy state. Now, uh, the normal way of reconnecting yourself with the divine is religions. Religious ceremonies, these are public, you go to the church, probably you don't have any particular enlightening or epiphanic experience in the church, but because of the strength of the community and because of the strength of tradition, you feel yourself united with the community and through that ritual you hope that uh, actually you are in a way reconnected with the divine. However, from the earliest times, humans were trying to find shortcuts, direct and more intensive ways for this reconnection. And uh, actually, most religious dogmas or most uh, sacred texts, including the Bible, have suggestion that humans have the chance for that and can re-deify themselves. So this deification of man is a very, very important uh, notion and ambition. If you think in the Bible, uh, the, the, the scriptures say that God created humans in his own image. So if we are the image of God, then we should have the same capacity of God for creation and actually uh, elevate ourselves back to the level of God. Now this is what we call, or actually I call, exaltatio. Uh, other terms for this have been commonly used like epiphany, illumination, enlightenment, and uh, revelation and such things. Uh, I, and let me boast a little bit, I introduced in scholarly literature the term exaltatio or exaltation for a specific reason. And I think that this is a very, it kind of highlights a very important aspect of this question. What is exaltatio? On the one hand, even in English, if you say, somebody is exalted or exaltation. Today it means something excitement, slightly mad or not so slightly mad, and uh, certainly something suspicious. But historically, the word on the one hand means elevation. If somebody is exalted, it means that, that somebody is kind of elevated from its normal status to a higher level, to a higher understanding or a higher esteem or prestige. Uh, and if you are very pious, of course, the ultimate aim of your exaltation is that you lift yourself back to the level of God. On the other hand, if you study etymological dictionaries, Latin dictionaries, they will tell you that or another original meaning of exaltatio is superbia in Latin, which is uh, nothing else but overweening pride. And if we think over the question of overweening pride, we easily get to the notion, the Greek notion of hubris, what uh, Aristotle also writes a lot about. Hubris is such a pride of people, of humans, who think that they can outwit the gods. They know it better. If they have a prophecy about some danger, like Oedipus in the Greek myth and in the play of Sophocles, uh, Oedipus can think that, okay, now I have the future, information about the future and I can do my best to avoid those dangers which are predicted in the prophecy. And of course this is such a pride which does not take into consideration that the gods are even wittier and they can bring you in such a situation that you fall. So the combination of piety and hubris is included in the term of exaltatio and I think that uh, it's a very useful term to examine certain characters who became associated with the occult in history, like Cornelius Agrippa or John Dee in the Renaissance, who show certain signs of a kind of schizophrenia between the piety and the uh, uncontrollable human pride. And of course, literary characters are also very much fitting into this, uh, into this category. 
uh, one of the archetypes is Dr. Faustus, as I mentioned, but uh, up to the today, and we are going to look at some of these modern novels which also bring up such characters. Uh, if you look at the complexities of the occult and magic, this table on the slide shows uh, different types of magic, and uh, that will be the, the summary uh, of the first part of my talk. Basically, we have to go back to this organic world picture. The organic world picture, or pre-modern, sometimes called the pre-modern world picture, divided the world, the cosmos, into three realms. One is nature, this is the material world in which we live. The next one is the celestial world, the world of the cosmic entities, the planets and the stars. And above them there is the transcendental world or the world of angels in Christian terminology and at the very top of course there is God. Now considering these three worlds occult thinking claimed that there is an appropriate magic fitting for all these or each of these three worlds. Nature can be manipulated by natural magic like meteorological procedures you can raise storm or calm storm or make rain or something like this. Uh, celestial magic, which is the next level, is basically talismanic magic, which uh, claim that the power of the stars, and of course if you think of astrology you know that the stars in a way determine your life, so if you collect in a talisman the power of the celestial bodies, then you can utilize this power for your benefit for making your life better or more fortunate or something like this and for this you use talismans carefully prepared carefully crafted with the appropriate symbols on it and using it in the appropriate time and finally the uh, highest level how to manipulate this, uh, the transcendental beings or supernatural beings this is what is called ceremonial magic so you have certain ceremonies uh, procedures uh, special signs, uh, you draw a circle around you, you have certain prayers, you have certain incantations, you may use uh, incense, uh, you know, certain fumigations, making uh, smells, and in this complexity the supernatural being is compelled to appear in front of you and you can engage in a conversation with that supernatural being or even uh, putting up demands or requests to these supernatural beings. So these are the three kinds of magic, ceremonial, talismanic and natural magic, and each of them has a white and a black aspect, depending on your initial purposes. If you want to use it for pious, beneficial purposes, it is white magic. If you have uh, sinister or, or some dangerous intentions, then it's black magic. And finally, there's two more divisions. One is elite and the other one is popular magic. The elite magic derives from books. It's not separated from practices, but the knowledge, the occult knowledge, the secret lore is usually included in uh, various uh, texts and these texts were handed down, uh, transmitted in various ways in different periods and, uh, and it needs the knowledge of languages, it needs the knowledge of philosophy and complicated concepts. Uh, popular magic is much simpler in a way. Sometimes it has connections with uh, elite magic, but it's rooted in folkloric rituals, folkloric practices, and, uh, and that separates the two. But I emphasize that there, there are always connections between the elite and the popular, and there are also always connections between the white and the black. They cannot absolutely straightforwardly separate it from each other. So, uh, that was the first part. I'm stopping the video now and I will continue the second part with uh, a summary of motives, such esoteric occult motives which appear in modern fiction. And then in the third part, of course, I will go to the case studies and show a number of, mo a number of novels uh, how this is actually uh, put into practice by uh, fiction writers. Thank you very much for your attention at this point.